Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday New York Times Read Along. We're so delighted to have this weekly gathering where we talk about the New York Times, we talk about the news, we talk about what's going on around the world. Please tag a friend, please hit share, please bring this community together right now. Tell us how your Sunday is going. Where are you watching from? We love hearing from you. We've got lots of great comments coming in. I see that Maureen is watching from Indiana. Very nice. Jane says, good morning. Jonathan's watching from the East Village, and I like that he's got his bandana on. Thanks very much, folks. Tell us how you are. Tell us where you are, and please hit share. This is the moment to do so. We have a wonderful show for you today. From now till about 10 o'clock, we're going to be with Judge Rosemarie Aquilina, the judge who presided over the 2018 USA Gymnastics sex abuse scandal. And then in the 10 o'clock hour, we'll be joined by Dr. Albert Johari from Atlanta, who will answer your medical questions. That's going to be a very cool show, very important show, very serious show. We are delighted also that our regular executive producer, Neil Parikh, is going to be guest hosting the show. And I was supposed to be traveling at this day, but of course there's no travel, but it does give me a chance to say hello to all of you and to have Neil running things instead today. Hi everybody, I'm Sri Srinivasan. I am the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism and Stony Brook University. Shout out to my students who are watching and uh, they, like so many millions of students around the world, have had their entire lives upended by what's going on, but they're doing remote learning really well. I may not be doing remote teaching really well, but they're doing remote learning really, really well. So everyone who's watching, please hit share, please retweet. We're live on Twitter and on Facebook and on LinkedIn. We have a great crew that produces this show. Let me bring them all in. Here is Neil Parikh, here is Steve Taylor, here's Paula Kiger, and here is Julia Weeks. Hi, everybody. Hey. Let me, let me just uh, unmute them so that they can say hello. Hi, Steve. Hello. You're, you're in Philadelphia, Paula's in Tallahassee, and Julia yes. is in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is a great team that brings you this show every week. We're able to do this, we're able to make this a professional show because of these folks. If you watch my daily COVID-19 show, which runs uh, every day global conversation, I produce that by myself. It doesn't look anything as good or as interactive as this. So please salute these folks. Please follow them on social media. We have their, uh, their social media handles across the bottom of the screen. Please do connect with them and they are just total pros, and I'm so grateful that they're part of our Read Along family. They make this possible, and so I'm so glad. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here, and thank you for what we're doing. We've got a great show today, and the reason we can have all of these folks working is because of our sponsors, so I want to give a shout out to our sponsors. We're going to have URLs just for the work that we are doing with them. We're going to post that on to our Facebook group so that you can uh, see them and click. That's the way we can show support. We'd like to thank our sponsors. We have Strategy Focus Group, a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. We're also sponsored by Muckrack, helps you discover news as it breaks, easily generate reports, and explore the work of journalists, podcasters, bloggers, and more. Muckrack software helps PR teams build strong relationships with the media. And if you're a journalist, you might also be eligible for their free tools to identify trends and showcase your work. I'm also honored to be an advisor to Muckrack. Thank you, Muckrack, for your support of the New York Times Read Along. And we're also sponsored by Tweeps Maps. The Tweeps Map, which helps you build personalized relationships with your audience with focused, straightforward, actionable analytics and an all-in-one intelligent publishing platform. Thank you to Ron Thomas of Strategy Focus Group, 
Greg Belant and Mike Schneider from Muckrack, and Samir al Batran from Tweepsmap for your support of the New York Times Read Along. If you're interested in sponsoring the New York Times Read Along, please contact me, Sri at Sri.net, or our executive producer, Neil, and you see his address, Neil at neilparik.org. So we are so grateful to our sponsors. We'd love to have more and support all our wonderful producers. So we're going to say goodbye to our producers for now. They're going to go produce. Mm -hmm. And we're going to hand it over to Neil in just a second. That's Paula Kiger. Follow her, folks. And that's Steve Taylor. And that's Julia Weeks. So Neil, how are you doing? Uh, how's the family? Uh, thank you, uh, Shri. Thanks for asking. Uh, doing well. Uh, we're certainly in uh, uh, we're in Springfield, Virginia. We've been home for several weeks now, and um, you know I think it's it's a new normal. I think a lot of what uh, we're reading about is that we need to prepare for a longer haul in terms of uh, uh, staying here and and dealing with this. Uh, in Virginia, we have stayed home order till June 10th. Uh, I'm not sure that we're going to be. Uh, um, you know, getting out, uh, you know, at that point. So we'll see. Um, but we have a lot of people joining us. I'd love to see who's uh, who's going to get the Narayan from Memphis, right? And Jane from Indiana. Um, and uh, uh, this is uh, um, a friend of uh, 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 Rose, Rosemary Aquilina. Uh, and I know that's her Twitter account, Hogshead3AU. Um, but I believe it's Sarah Hogshead uh, Macker, or M-A-K-E-R, I believe. I can't remember um, exactly how to pronounce her name. My mom is watching from Hastings on Hudson. Hi, mom. How are you doing? And Susie Sharp from uh, Cleveland as well. One of the things I want to mention to folks, uh, Andrea, a colleague from United Way in New Jersey, glad you could watch. Um, for people who are watching, and you might be watching uh, on a Facebook feed that was shared, make sure you click on the actual video uh, and then comment uh, in the video. That way we'll be able to see your comments uh, the same for Twitter. If you're watching on Twitter, uh, click on the video and then comment within the Periscope because uh, we'd love to be able to see your comments and put them on the screen uh, like we're doing with Sujana Chandrasekhar, a doctor who's been on your show, Shri, uh, and she was on the read-along a few weeks ago as well. Uh, Carla Platter from Cape Coral, Florida. Rochelle Filipek, another uh, neighbor from Hastings on Hudson. Uh, and uh, Rupa Unikrish, she sounds familiar, uh, Shri. Um, <laughs> She's right around right around. watching. She just brought a, <laughs> she just brought our a beagle home from her walk. Uh, our Rupa, beagle thank you so home. much. We used to take her for three to four walks a day. Now she's going just twice out. Yeah. Every time Rupa leaves or I take her out, it feels like we're going into Chernobyl. We don't know what's going to uh, get us. But you can see it's a beautiful day outside. We've got our Upper West Side camera on. It's it's still cold and very windy, and so that's why we, we're the cameras indoors today. And Paula is, of course, watching, and she's linked to all of our wonderful sponsors. We're so grateful. And look at Linda is watching from Long Island, and our friend Stefan is watching. And he has a terrific new show that I'm just going to give a plug for right now. You can watch him on Thursday at April 23rd this week at 1 p.m., and he's got a fabulous guest photographer. Uh, he's talking about photography and social media all through this crisis. He's had some terrific shows already. Please follow him at Spin It Social. And the Spin It Social Hour is the hashtag. So that's great. Folks, tell us where you're watching from. We'd love to say hello. We're going to introduce the judge in just a second. And tell us who Claudia is, Neil. Uh, I would love to tell you who Claudia is. And, and we have another promo that we want to share. Claudia is going to be our guest next week on the Read Along. Um, she is an, uh, a reporter. She's actually written a, a conversations column with the New York Times uh, for uh, 20 years. Uh, she's known for her unusual interviews uh, with scientists, policymakers, and international figures that you can read there. And uh, she's also doing a class um, through Columbia, and they've been uh, live streaming their class. Donald McNeil, who has a cover story in today's Times, was a guest, I think it was uh, two weeks ago, uh, and, and it's just been really great to, to work with her. So I'm looking forward to next week's show as well. Yeah, and um, we saw her in a preview last week because her husband was our guest, Andrew Hacker, 
who did yes. with an amazing conversation. Folks, everything is archived on our YouTube channel. That's the best way to find me and all my shows that I'm doing. So just go to youtube.com slash Srinet and please, please subscribe. That way you'll get an alert every time we're live and you will get to know what we're doing. Please tell us where you're watching from. We're getting ready for the judge. And look at this amazing list of previous guests we've had. Just a tiny fraction. We've been doing this for five years, folks, five years. And uh, along the way, we have had a chance to interview some fabulous people, including Tom Jolly, the print editor of the New York Times, Amy Vershop, travel editor of the New York Times. We went to their homes and did the read along there. Stacey Stewart, the president and CEO of the March of Dimes, Harlan Coben, number one New York Times bestseller, his book, The Week It Hit Number One, he was on, and he's got three shows on Netflix right now, and Sonny Slaughter, awesome friend of ours, guest on the 1619 Project Special Edition. So there are so many great people who make it possible for us to have this show. Please do go into our archives and please share the video right now. And I think we're ready, Neil, how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. We can definitely uh, start. As a reminder, we're live every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Um, and uh, you know, we have, uh, you know, we wanna make sure people share where they're watching from uh, and to mention or uh, share, mention a friend or share uh, this feed so people can, can watch it. Uh, so I'll go ahead and uh, uh, take the reins of the show, Shri. Again, I wanna thank you uh, for everything you've done and uh, for giving me the honor and the privilege of, uh, of um, being the executive producer and guest host on occasion for uh, uh, this show. So thank you uh, for all of that. Um, and uh, with that, I, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the paper first before we bring in our guest, Rosemarie Aquilina. Um, I am just, I'm absolutely amazed at what the Times has been doing and what uh, we've been able to, they've been able to report on. Uh, so I'm gonna switch to my uh, uh, New York Times camera. Bring in the audio. Uh, so hopefully you can hear me and I'll take the sound off so we don't have the echo. Um, so what I want to do is just give you a sense of what's in the paper today real quick. And then uh, we'll bring on the judge uh, to talk about how she's doing personally and also you know, what justice is like uh, during COVID-19, among other things. Um, the, uh, the front page of the New York Times, the display story, uh, a major effort by Donald McNeil Jr. What the next year or two may look like under COVID-19. Um, and with the, the lead is always in the top right corner, a rising shortage of dialysis units alarms doctors. That's a new... Uh, emerging issue. Uh, when it comes to essential, it's a women's world today and is six feet enough uh, for uh, uh, staying apart. We've been, uh, they've been preaching uh, six feet uh, separation for um, uh, COVID-19. But the special, the special issues today, the America we need, this is a full section from the uh, New York Times opinion section uh, uh, with a number of articles, the subhead down here from some of its darkest Hours, the United States has emerged stronger. We have the chance to do it again. A really, really incredible section. We have the New York Times Magazine. We'll show uh, the uh, behind this, uh, the magazine cover video uh, later in the show. Sheree will tee that up for us. A um, little bit of a role reversal, folks. Uh, my hosting and, and Sheree guest, Sheree uh, executive producing. Uh, but this is an incredible photo essay uh, inside New York City's hospitals that we'll look at later. Um, but there's, you know, it, it's kind of like uh, on Passover, uh, you know, Dayenu, that would have been enough, but there is more. Uh, the New York Times parenting section, pandemic parenting, taking care of children, we've got you. Here are some tips for staying healthy, entertained, and sane these days. And I don't know, I'll be uh, curious if that was online as well. I believe that several of the articles have been shared. Uh, I don't know if it was in a package or not. Uh, even the Sunday style section, dressed up without a prom, looking at um, high school seniors who were uh, supposed to enjoy their prom. A lot of uh, high school seniors, college seniors, not getting to do graduation ceremonies. The travel section, uh, our friend Sebastian Modak um, has a piece 
Uh, he was the 52 Places Traveler in 2019, and, and he was with us at Amy Vership's house back in January. He met people all over the world uh, as 52 Places Traveler uh, in 2019. Reaching out to them now, he feels far from alone, uh, which is really uh, interesting. Every section is focusing on, even the book review, books make great company. Um, so that's just a, a sense of where the... Uh, the paper uh, is going, uh, what's in the paper this week. But before we get there, uh, I want to introduce and bring on our uh, guest for today, um, our judge, uh, Judge Rosemary Aquilina. So I'll just do the quick uh, switch and take off the, the phone and bring in Judge Rosemary Aquilina. Judge Rosemary, how are you doing? Thank you very much. We just have to unmute you real quick. There we go. All right. That's much better. Saying, yes, thanks for having me. It's very exciting. And it's Nancy Hogshead Maycar. Maycar. Thank you yeah. very much. I appreciate that. We're so glad to have her join us uh, today. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is to start with asking uh, a little bit how are you doing um, under COVID-19? What is uh, what has been your personal experience so far? We'll talk about work and, and how you're dealing with judicial proceedings, but as a human being, what, what's happening in your world? So I really am back to basics. I am baking bread and got my sewing machine out. I am trying to be teacher and mom to my children, which does not work very well. I think most of the parents Parents can agree with me. What do we do with the kids who want to be outside and with their friends? My 10 year olds just had their birthday yesterday and I sort of did a do of Easter, got some chalk and, and uh, did some things out in the yard. But uh, we're trying to keep everybody entertained and occupied. I'm also part of a one world group if anybody wants to join. Uh, it's really a virtual community that was started by Molly B Molly Bloom, who's a friend of mine. Um, she, if you've ever watched the movie Molly's Game, that's her. And her and her husband, Devin, started this uh, virtual community show every day at two o'clock, or almost every day. I get together with hundreds of people from around the world and we chat. And it's really just a way to keep connected with the outside. So it's pretty much back to basics uh, in my world, cooking and um, trying to keep the kids occupied. And I think that's the struggle that everyone is feeling along with trying not to be isolated. It's, uh, it's certainly been challenging. Um, we have a number of people watching. Uh, and uh, I wanted to, first of all, you know, thank you. We're also streaming, in addition to our regular channels, we're streaming to your Facebook and Twitter accounts uh, as well. Uh, so we're having a few, few folks. Uh, I'm wondering if these are friends of yours, uh, potentially Robin Ulmer, um, if you, Teresa Post, uh, Leamy, uh, watch, both watching from Facebook, Ali Nunn. Uh, well, these are names you recognize, let us know. Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, I certainly recognize people. Um, and Ali, I see her almost every day at the One World Group. And yes, we have a lot of people uh, yeah, joining great. us. Great, um, and we have uh, just a slew of comments I'm going to see if we can get to uh, uh, some of them. Uh, there's a, a Charles uh, Aquilina you might know from Maryland. Yeah, my looks like uh, my uh, cousin. Oh, your cousin, there's great. A, yeah, great. So there's, yeah. Um, and Ali is tagging. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say the name Aquilina is not common in the United States, but in Malta, it's like a Smith. It's very common. So um, there aren't very many of us. So I'm related to most of them, I think. <laughs> great, great. We have David Thorpe watching from here in Alexandria. Uh, Mara Gulens uh, watching from Toronto. Um, and I uh, just want to call it Ali had tagged uh, Kelly Collins uh, Adolson. Uh, that's a great way of bringing people in. Uh, if there are people you think should watch the show, uh, please tag them so that uh, they get a notification and they can watch. Um, and uh, we have a great comment here from uh, Minky Warden. Uh, and we're just going to read that uh, out loud. And it's a long comment, so we have to watch our uh, uh, framing. Um, 
as you talked about Nancy uh, uh, Hogshead Maker, is a legend in sports and human rights advocacy for women and girls in sport. She founded Champion Women and is three times gold medal Olympian swimming in 84, working to stop all abuse in sport. She and Judge Rosemary McLean are my heroes. Nancy would be a great future guest. Rosemary, what do you think of that? Do you think we could get, um, uh, do, you th do you think we could get Nancy as a guest uh, on the show? Yes, absolutely. I've been working with Nancy and, and her group on safe sport, uh, passing some legislation in Congress to make sure that uh, athletes have a voice. And Nancy is the go-to person on this. And thank you for the shout out, Minky. Uh, Minky's also part of a group of uh, making sure that people are safe and athletes have a voice. So we've all been working together and I'm really honored that they're here joining us. And I will talk to Nancy if you'd like. She would be an outstanding guest. That would be great. Uh, just we have Min Pham joining us from Vietnam, uh, a, a good example of how this show really is international in scope. Uh, we get a number of people, Sandra Flay watching from Ontario, Canada, uh, and Buchholz watching from Germany uh, as well. Uh, and we have Albert Johari who will be joining us uh, a little later in the program from Atlanta. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Johari. We'll look forward to uh, talking with you about COVID-19 and following up on some of the issues we're gonna raise with uh, um, uh, Rosemary Aquilina. Uh, so let's uh, go through, there's still a lot of comments. Uh, we'll try and get to uh, more of them later. Um, but the first thing I wanna do just in terms of some of the topics we wanna talk about, uh, at, under COVID-19, all of our lives are being thrown upside down, right? Um, as a judge, how is the how are the stay at home orders the six feet of separation um how's that impacting your work how are you uh, able to dispense justice and and hold judicial proceedings uh in these circumstances we are using zoom so justice uh has to go on 24 7 just like crime 24 7 right it doesn't stop so what we are doing is first of all we have had to clean out the jail it's not empty but it's probably it's at uh, 1980 numbers. That's how many we've released because of safety concerns. And so we've had a lot of people on tether and we're monitoring people at home. We've released some people early for their safety. So we, we're very cognizant of that issue and, and in the prisons are having a huge issue. For the judges in our county and I think around the United States, we are holding hearings on Zoom and they're open meetings. So if anybody wanted to listen to a hearing, they just go on my website and they ask for a code and they can enter the Zoom meeting. So we're still having open meetings. It's a little bit different, um, but we all are able to interact and not infringe on anybody's rights. If somebody does not want to have a hearing through Zoom, we're just postponing it, but it doesn't look like we're probably going to get to a full courthouse till sometime after June. And there are always issues that we have to deal with. So we are having court just via technology. Thank God for technology, truly. And what are some of the, the challenges with uh, uh, going online, uh, doing, doing hearings? If I'm not mistaken, if, uh, if, if people want to watch one of your hearings, um, the link isn't available on your website. You're not, you're not streaming it to your website. You have to call your office and, yeah. and get a, a sign up, get register or get a link. How does, why yeah. do you do that? Yeah. So I have, I'm of a different mind than some of the judges. There are judges who are streaming their hearings. The problem that I have with streaming is that once something's on the internet, it's never, off and there's some talk about putting it into a like a 30-day box but i'm still not happy with that because in court we have a hearing one day and then it's gone right and what you have left is the transcript my court reporter is there making a transcript so anybody can join us by zoom you simply have to call we'll give you the code and we've done that because there are people out there who are sort of bombing hearings and meetings. And so we're not doing that, but it is open. You call for a code and I've had members of the public join us. And so we're having uh, those Zoom hearings, as many people as want to attend can. It's a little bit challenging because we have to be mindful, like on this show, of not talking over each other, making sure everything's clear. 
but anybody can join. I just don't believe that justice is served by having someone who's not found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, who has all their rights streamed all over the world. And that I think is a safeguard that I'm doing. It's a public hearing, but not something that is out there to be streamed. And then of course, I find it offensive that my trial or my, not, we're not doing trials, but my hearing could be streamed and then somebody puts an advertisement in, you know, I, I'm not there selling, you know, toothpaste. So for a lot of reasons, I have chosen to do the Zoom and to have people call in. We give you the number and it's worked beautifully. Other judges are streaming, but I don't think this is the right way to have a judicial show. Um, I, I think that concern for privacy and that concern for, for the long term is really important. You know, uh, whether it's uh, online or, or on social media, these comments, videos, screenshots, they last forever. Uh, and, and I think people are, are starting to become more aware of that. And obviously we're more aware of some of the issues around Zoom in particular. Uh, Laura Silverman, a former guest on the show uh, from Philadelphia, she has a, a great project called Portraits from Parkland. After the shooting in uh, uh, Florida, she drew um, ink uh, portraits of all the uh, people who lost their lives and, and a little bit of a bio from them. Uh, you can find more on her website uh, and her Facebook page. I know that uh, uh, Paula and others will share those links. Um, she's asking a question. Uh, she participated in a free our youth action this week, uh, asking governors to release uh, children from juvenile facilities where the virus may prove fatal uh, and get them home if, if that's a safe place. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the, the impact on um, the coronavirus has had on jails and, you know, uh, what those issues around, um, you know, what responsibility do you have to people who are incarcerated and, and how the virus might spread in those kind of confined quarters? Uh, how should we be thinking about that? Yeah, look, I'm I'm trying to release as many. In fact, the prosecutors have said, please keep this person in. But I am releasing people out on tether, and especially if I have someone who's young. And I think that the juveniles ought to go home. Here's the problem that people don't realize: not everybody has a home to go to. And some of the juveniles we have were homeless to begin with, or their family has abandoned them for whatever reason. And so we have to be mindful. I will release someone to a home and it's really difficult to release to a shelter because the shelters are not open or they're, they're booked. So we're having multiple problems. And I am releasing, especially the young, especially anybody who has a stable home uh, where we can tether them or just uh, forgive the rest of the balance. We are all trying to do that. I know some judges are harsher than others. I'm very mindful that if there is a breakout, uh, it's going to be incredibly deadly in any facility. It's happening in the nursing homes. It's only a matter of time before the jails. It's happening in the prisons. The youth center is a real concern. I think all or, or most of those children should go home or to some kind of foster provider if they don't have a home. The problem is we have a shortage of even foster providers. So what do we do? I think what happens ultimately is that this is a signal that we have to do better overall and we have to plan for these emergency situations and what will happen to those people who are locked up. I'm not happy with it. I am releasing people over the objection of the prosecutor because there is no cure from death. And once that coffin's closed, it's closed forever, but we can open the jails now, we can open the prisons now, with those people we can and at least reduce the population for safety. Thank you, That that I think is, very important for people to hear and, and for people to see that that perspective, um, the, that focus on safety and that and compassion really at the end of the day, um, you know that's it's a it's a mindset that's a that's a, a way of thinking I think uh, we need we need more of um, you know for folks who are just joining us uh, our guest on this week's Shri uh, uh, Sunday New York Times read along is Judge Rosemary Aquilina. Uh, she uh, is well known, you may know her from the uh, uh, USA gymnastics uh, sex abuse uh, uh, scandal, the Larry Nasser case, as some people refer to it. Um, very famously, 
She, uh, as part of the, the plea deal, uh, allowed uh, girls, the women, to speak their truth. I didn't think that would catch me. Sorry. Um, this is an emotional issue. Um, yeah. And uh, um, it was so powerful to, to give people a voice. Here's, here's the thing. Let me just um, interject here. I have, I've been a judge now, a civilian judge. I was in the military for 20 years as a military judge, but also civilian-wise, 16 years now. At the time of Nasser, it was 14 years. But the power of the robe has never escaped me. And so from the day I took the bench, I have always let everybody speak over the objection of prosecutors, attorneys, um, the sheriff, everybody wanted to get back and do their own thing, get back to clients, get back to business. They don't want to be locked in my courtroom. I don't care. The only case that's in front of me is the case that's in front of me and everything else out. So if I have one victim or five victims or 500 victims, it doesn't matter to me. They are the most important people. And along with defendants, defendants have families too. And normally, uh, I let them speak too. Oftentimes, a defendant's family wants to talk. Uh, a couple of months ago, I had a murder situation. Two young people, they were playing with guns, and one murdered the other. And it was very powerful, as powerful, I think, as the girls, when about six people from each family spoke. It took us a couple of hours, but the mother of the deceased boy stood up and said, how wonderful her son was, but then turned around to the other mother and said, and I am so very sorry on that day. We both lost a son and I grieve for you too. And then the other mother got up and also apologized to the other mother and said, and you are right. And I am so sorry you lost your son. And that was such a powerful moment in the courtroom because when the two sides can hear each other and say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry goes a long way to, in healing and giving voice to victims. And you saw that in the Nasser case. Um, it starts their healing because prior to that, so many of them had not been believed, had not been heard. And many of those girls spoke in front of me and their parents had never heard the story. But that's the power of believing. That's the power of voice. I try to use the power of the robe for more than just sentencing. I don't want to be known as that evil judge. And there are people who think I am evil. I want to be known as someone who spoke for the community and for humanity, looked at safety and looked at each human being um, who was in front of me and heard them. I think that's our justice system. Um, I want to thank you. Uh, there are some great comments. I want to thank you personally. For that moment, um, you know, a number of people are are sharing. Uh, Judge Judge Rosemary um, Aquilina, um, this is Laura's comment. Trial was one of the most powerful examples in giving a voice to victims. Hard to measure the impact of that. It's so vast. Uh, Julia Weeks, one of our producers, uh, thank you for Judge uh, Judge Aquilina for giving survivors a voice. A uh, quick note about Julia. Uh, I've asked Julia to actually be uh, on my Facebook page because we're streaming there as well. So uh, for any friends and family who are watching, uh, if, if um, you have any questions, Julia will be able to answer them for you. Um, and uh, we have uh, Anne uh, Buchholz uh, saying uh, you're a gift of the universe. Uh, hope for many. Um, Therese Steiner, thank you for returning uh, uh, dignity to these young female gymnasts. And uh, Paula Kiger shared, uh, love our community and the fact that we can be human with each other. And um, I wanna take take that this moment. Um, Paula has been an incredible uh, source of support as has the New York Times real on community. This is not the first time that we've talked about these issues um, on the New York Times read along. We've actually uh, talked about um, sexual abuse today. This month is National Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Uh, Denim Day is an event that's coming up on April 29th to show support for survivors. Um, we have uh, 
had special editions of our New York Times read along um, dealing with this. And, and I'm just going to take a, a moment uh, and again, recognizing uh, uh, Paula's uh, love for our community. In it, it was two years ago now uh, for folks who, who uh, watched the show. And if uh, you saw me choking up earlier, if you saw me choking up earlier when uh, we first started talking about the uh, women that uh, Rosemary gave a voice to, it's because uh, I'm a survivor as well. Um, I, I shared my story for the first time uh, on the New York Times read along uh, in, um, in a public venue. Uh, I had shared it with a, with a few people um, individually, but I chose the New York Times read along as uh, the place that I came out with my story. And uh, a number of people, uh, Don Helmrich in particular, but also um, uh, Rose Horowitz, Christine Gritman, uh, Paula, um, and, and others after I shared my story, shared, shared their stories as well and, and reached out to me for love and support. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I still remember when, when the trial went, when it happened and, um, I should have started this earlier and I, and I, or I should have said this earlier. I apologize. Um, we did put it in the post that, that, um, that, that people may be triggered by this conversation. Um, it's not easy for people who are survivors to, to talk about this, to, to bring this up. Um, uh, I'll admit it even surprised me, even though I knew that the, uh, the show was happening and that we'd be talking about these issues. Uh, but it's, it's, that's the power of, of um, these experiences and the power of what you did, uh, Rosemary, um, giving people a voice, giving people um, that strength uh, around you. So uh, personally, I want to thank you for that and tell you how much I appreciated um, that work. I want to I bring on a, a friend of ours, if I may, uh, Abigail Pesta, uh, Abby, if you will. Um, Abby, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, on the show. You wrote a book about the girls, uh, called The Girls, right? Uh, about the, the women who were abused uh, in that case. And you're holding up the book. Thank you uh, for, for doing that. Um, can you uh, uh, talk a little bit about the book that you read and your work with uh, uh, Rosemary? Yes, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Neil, thank you for sharing your story. That takes true courage, and that's what gives other people courage, you know, to know they're not alone and that they, too, can share their stories. And that's the kind of empowerment that Judge Apollina hello, gave all the women who stood up in court, too. You know, I spoke with 25 survivors of Larry Nassar's abuse and their families, and so many of them told me, how much it meant to them to have the judge giving them courage and strength and support in that courtroom. You know, Judge Aquilina spoke to each and every woman who stood up. More than 150 women stood up in court, and also some of their parents, sisters, brothers, family members, husbands. Judge Aquilina spoke to each one of them personally. <laughs> it took seven days. Who does that? <laughs> and the more, Judge Aquilina does that. And the more women who stood up, the more women, you know, saw that and decided to stand up. So throughout the course of the week, the number of women who stood up to give their victim impact statements to directly to the court and to Larry Nasser, it kept growing because they saw, you know, the power in sharing those stories. So, um, you know, thank you both for everything that you do. And um, and yes, the book, it was a very, you know, these women just told phenomenal stories of how this happened, how this predator was allowed to get away with this for nearly 30 years. Um, you know, a lot of people don't realize that, well, for one thing, he preyed on kids. So a lot of kids didn't realize they were being abused. He was the doctor. He was the Olympic doctor. He was trusted. Some kids did realize, and they did report his abuse over the decades, starting back in the 90s. They reported him to coaches, to counselors, to the police. No one listened to the girl. Everyone listened to the doctor. So there are really powerful lessons in these stories that um, that we can 
can learn from and try to prevent that from happening again. And uh, I want to uh, just give you a shout out, uh, Abby, um, for you and our friend uh, Michelle Raphael uh, from uh, Los Angeles. Uh, um, both were instrumental in uh, uh, putting us in, us in touch with uh, Rosemary and having her on the show. So thank you so much uh, for helping to make that happen. We really appreciate that. And big shout out to uh, Michelle uh, Raphael as well. Um, a number of people, Maureen uh, O'Hara Pesta said That's hi. Mom. <laughs> Is that mom? Yeah. Uh, and, and we should mention Abby was a guest on our show back in October. Um, I think it was just after the book, uh, a, a book party, the same weekend as the book party. Right, yes. But that was uh, great to have you on the show at the time. Um, and uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, all of the comments uh, that people shared, and I showed them on the screen while you were talking, but uh, folks who were expressing support and uh, um, you know, giving strength uh, to sharing uh, our stories. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, Rosemary, uh, do me a favor. The, uh, Abby wrote a piece on, uh, on CNN, I think back in uh, uh, February of this year, earlier January even, January. I think. Yeah. Um, you know, t tell me a little bit about uh, the work that you've done together and, and, and your, your collaboration. How have you, uh, have you, how do you know each other? How have you been able to support each other? Uh, can you speak to that? So let me start by after the Nasser case, I was literally bombarded by the world, uh, media, uh, survivors, uh, all sorts of people. And Abigail was one of the people who reached out because she was writing this book. And I was a bit skeptical because I didn't want, you know, the story belongs to the girls. And I did some research on her and found out how very special she is in terms of her research and um, her ability to convey a story. And so she was one of the few that I agreed to talk with and not about the girl's story because that's theirs, but really about mine. And so I met Abigail a couple of years ago. And since then we have crossed paths and have become friends. We've gone to a lot of the same kinds of functions and speaking engagements and really just supported each other's work because it's important to have a voice and it's also really important and i think abigail is one of those people who does the media world justice um in my courtroom i have always had responsible journalists and i i was really blessed during the nasser case to not have any problems and to watch media from all places work together for the feed and to act appropriately in a courtroom and get the message out however they wanted but i think there was such responsible journalism i think there should be uh, journalists in every courtroom every day, not just on a particular high profile case. And Abigail really has that voice to speak for people and to have the sensitivity for all the issues and to convey a human story. And we just have become friends uh, as a result of that, right, Abby? Absolutely. And, you know, I wrote the CNN piece that Neil mentioned because I had seen firsthand from talking to all these women, all these NASA survivors, how much it meant to them to have a judge supporting them and encouraging them and empowering them. And I had also seen it, you know, well beyond the courtroom. You know, I wrote about this in the piece. I, you know, I, I was at an event with Judge Aquilina in New York City and there was a gymnast who had never met her. She was one of the survivors. She was still trying to come to grips with the fact that she had been abused as a child. A lot of these women were adults when they realized they had been abused as children. And, you know, they're, they're dealing with so many battles, just brain battles coming to grips with this. This was their trusted doctor. And who do they trust now? And, you know, it's it's so, it's just so complicated and, and confusing. And so she was in the, the throes of, you know, coming to grips with this and dealing with this. And she met the judge for the first time because she hadn't, she hadn't traveled to Michigan to speak in court. She you know, was suffering from PTSD. She didn't want to get into a plane and be in a confined space. So she meets the judge for the first time, and I, she was nervous. You know, she was so excited to meet the judge, and um, and she was, you know, emotional and starting to cry. And I, I saw such a personal and beautiful moment. The judge walked with her over to a mirror and said, "Look in the mirror and and tell yourself I matter." And you know, she couldn't do it at first. And she was looking in the mirror and she was crying. And then finally she said, it, I matter. That to me spoke volumes about 
the power that Judge Aquilina, you know, instills in survivors. I saw it firsthand. It was a beautiful moment. And um, yeah, so, you know, I wrote the piece, I wrote the CNN piece because I wanted to convey that sense of what all these women have said the judge has meant to them. Because, um, you know, there are, there are some critics, of course, as always. And, um, and I wanted to get the facts out there, too. You know, some critics have said, well, Judge Aquilina was too harsh. You know, she spoke too harshly to Larry Nasser. Um, and she shouldn't be, you know, continuing to empower survivors <laughs> outside the courtroom. And the fact is, um, Larry Nasser pleaded guilty. And the more than 150 women who spoke in court did so because he had agreed to let survivors speak in his plea agreement. And the judge's sentence was within the guidelines of the plea agreement that Nasser himself agreed to. So um, did she have some harsh words for him in court? Yes. <laughs> and, and yay for that, you know, <laughs> that was a very human response. This guy abused young women and girls, children for nearly three decades. That's that's great. Um, thank you. Thank you, Abby. We're getting some comments from LinkedIn as well. Uh, so I'm going to uh, have Shri. Shri's putting them in, in YouTube. Shri, you can also put them in uh, as a banner uh, in StreamYard and then uh, put them on the screen that way. Um, but we have Pritchard Freudenberg saying having the freedom of speech is the foundation of our Constitution and thankful that you uh, fully respect that. And we had a number of people, uh, Abby, uh, praising your book and the work uh, and and your uh, um, uh, work with uh, uh, Rosemary as well. Um, we have another comment from LinkedIn uh, uh, from Jeffrey uh, Pletz. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rosemary, for sharing your experiences today. Um, and see what else we have. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll give it over, actually, Shri. Show us some more comments. Uh, I'm going to take my hands off the uh, uh, the controls for a moment. Um, and and uh, Nancy is making sure that we. Uh, Danny Turco, a uh, friend of mine from high school, actually is watching. Thank you, Danny, uh, giving me some strength there. Uh, and uh, Therese uh, Steiner, a friend of ours from Yonkers, um, saying that this is a terrific New York Times read along. And we haven't actually spent a lot of time with the paper yet, uh, so I want to make sure that we get there uh, as well. Um, Mark Lee uh, from North Carolina, a uh, frequent um, viewer. I sometimes wonder how often in the minority community our institutions, the black church, black press, hides from this issue and in some cases empower uh, the victimizers, the abusers. Uh, Janet Walsh joining us from uh, Minnesota. Um, so uh, with that, uh, Abby, I'm gonna thank you for, for joining us. Uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, move to uh, the paper a little bit. Thank you. Also, Is there anything you'd like to say before? Yes, I wanted to point out that, did you know the judge also writes mystery novels? <laughs> the judge also writes mystery novels. Yes, uh, you can and, check them out, juicy mysteries. <laughs> and, and in fact, <laughs> there's an interesting connection. Uh, she has actually offered advice to uh, uh, our, one of our more recent guests on the read along, uh, Harlan Coben, uh, mm -hmm. when he reached out on Twitter asking about uh, Rosemary, it was what drink should a character have? Yeah. <laughs> right? Was it for the stranger, do you know? I don't, it might have been. I, he was, uh, I, I love Harlan Coben. I just read, uh, I don't know what book, I because I've read so many of his, but he was asking, which I thought was such a fun thing to ask uh, on Twitter, what should these people be drinking? And so, <laughs> Um, I, he liked my response and I thought, wow, you know, this, that made my day. It actually made my last couple of years probably because I would <laughs> never forget that Harlan, you know, this New York times bestseller author, I really liked my two word response, you know, but, right. it's, it's actually Harlan Coben, former guest on the New York times read along yeah. and also New York times number one bestseller. I mean, we should put that in the right order, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 yeah, that was uh, incredible. And I actually watched the uh, um, uh, the stranger uh, after we had him on the show. Uh, I, I binge watched it. It's an incredible show. I encourage everyone to to watch. But yes, uh, and and Shri is uh, reminding us we have a number of uh, uh, great guests that have been on the show. Um, Tom Jolly, the New York Times print editor, 
and uh, Amy Vershep, the travel editor, uh, two shows we did from their houses in uh, New Jersey and New York, respect, uh, respectively. Stacy Stewart, uh, president and CEO of March of Dimes. She was actually formerly at United Way, where I work uh, um, as my day job. Uh, the real long is my evening and weekend gig. Um, Harlan Coben, as we mentioned, and then Sonny Slaughter. And I want to take a moment. Um, Sonny Slaughter was also someone that I was able to share my story with uh, after we had our show. Uh, I was introduced to her by a, a mutual friend. She was our guest on the 1619 Project, which focused on the impact of slavery on a modern day, the, the 350 years of, of slavery, a uh, special New York Times project. A very emotional, very powerful show. Uh, and then we stayed and talked for about an hour after that. Uh, and uh, again, similar to my conversation with you, Rosemary, uh, I was able to open up to her very quickly. So a big shout out to Sonny Slaughter as well. You can find a lot of our uh, recent uh, shows on our YouTube archives uh, and uh, encourage you to join us. We're here every Sunday at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time uh, with the guest and um, yeah, have some incredible discussions as we are having today. Uh, so with that, Abby, thank you for joining us. I think this is uh, longer than I asked you to stay. Uh, oh, but thank it was, you for uh, having me, I'm honored. Great to see you. Really great, great conversation. Um, Rosemary, uh, let's talk about uh, a little bit about what's in the paper today, because um, there's some really interesting um, uh, stories uh, particularly around coronavirus, and uh, as I mentioned, that first um, that, that front page story uh, around what the next year or two will look like. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, shift to that real quickly. Um, we'll put the audio on, so hopefully people can hear me. And uh, um, this, uh, what the next year or two may look like. Um, what are you thinking, uh, Rosemary, in terms of how, how long are you planning uh, in terms of the stay-at-home order? And I know Michigan has been a hotbed recently around that as well. Right now, we're just staying home until the end of the month. I think that that's going to be extended um, probably another month or two. I don't actually have my first jury trial scheduled until um, June 15th or 16th. Um, and it may be pushed back. I really don't think that will be to full operations till mid June and it may be longer. And then I'm expecting sort of a round two of coronavirus, uh, that at least that's what they're predicting. So maybe again in the fall, I can just tell you that what I've done is I've made sure that, uh, each of my staff members have five masks. So we have one per day and we can wash them and we're just going to probably not be at the numbers we allow in the courthouse, but have a slow integration. I don't know how else we can um, operate. We're, we're going to have to get people to work. We can't get people to work too soon because businesses will open, but baskets will open, so we need to think about safety. So I, I think that we're not going to get back to full masses for a while until there's some kind of cure or uh, chemical that we know cleans this that's safe for people. I think there's going to be a lot of changes. That's, that's I think, this is the inside of that story, uh, which is really long uh, online, uh, but a great, um, you know, very uh, powerful, uh, dark image uh, of someone in a tent. And people who are experiencing homelessness uh, are particularly vulnerable at this time. But some of the comments, um, we face a doleful future we need to reopen the faucet gradually, not allow the floodgates to open, to reopen rather. And people need to realize that it's not safe to play poker wearing bandanas. Um, that's an interesting, interesting thought. And you see uh, as well, the story continues what the next year or two may look like, particularly if we have um, wave after wave of, of infections if people come back and, and, and think they're okay and then you know, keep spreading the virus. Um, this is uh, continuing in the in the paper. Uh, here's this this article, and we, we said we would talk about this a little bit. Decline in police reports about domestic violence may be very scary sign. Uh, there is a concern that uh, uh, from uh, agencies um, like the New York uh, State Office for the Prevention of Domestic Violence, uh, groups like Sucky uh, for New York, a, a group focused on the South Asian community, and others. Um, 
there's a lot of concern about um, the what's happening with people staying at home and stuck at home and and tensions uh, boiling anger boiling um, what are, are are you seeing uh, any of that from your perspective uh, in terms of the courtroom you know there has been a decline there are we have people every day who are dealing with personal protection orders and domestic violence issues but you know we have to figure that domestic violence occurs in our nation every 15 seconds and 24 people per minute are victims of rape and 20 people per minute are abused by an intimate partner. Those numbers I think are not going down even though statistics look like they are. What's happening is that people, children, um, partners are living with each other, but not feeling safe to report it. They're locked in a home. And I think this is one of the things that we have to address in the future is how can we get people help who are locked in a home? There should be a signal that we teach children that they could put in a window. So if somebody goes by, there's a check on that house. Uh, there needs to be safe routes for people to get out of the house. People need to be told if you some fighting, call, call the enforcement safety check. However, these people have they're with their abuser they have no way to call no way to get out nowhere to go the shelters many of them are not accepting people it's very unsafe at this point very volatile very very concerning um we have uh, uh stories about the crowds protesting stay at home orders in texas as a defined wave sweeps the nation um there were uh, similar protests in michigan uh, this yep. week as well, right? Um, yep. And there's expected to be another one coming up. Um, the Michigan militia is going to come now, and, and they want another with weapons. The problem, you know, I looked at the pictures. I wasn't there. My parents were actually at the hospital and were stuck in traffic for four hours during that, uh, what happened in Michigan. And I looked at the pictures and video of it, and there were people not following the, um, the rules. There were no masks, they were in close contact. And I have to wonder how much illness will spawn from that. I, we have to be careful. The rules are in place for a reason and everybody's anxious to get to work, but you go in a coffin, you're not going back to work. So, you know, there has to be a balancing test and, you know, I'm military trained and as a mom too, it's safety first, safety over money. You're in the National Guard, right? Um, I served for 20 years, yes. I'm retired. From you were the, retired. I'm the, I was the first female JAG officer in the history of the Michigan Army National Guard. I served 20 years honorably. Best career ever. Uh, such camaraderie and the things that I've learned uh, are irreplaceable. Um, one of the things that, as far as the paper is concerned, you know, there's so much focus on, on coronavirus and uh, each section is finding their way to, to deal with it. Um, it reminds me of, of uh, after 9-11, where I remember seeing, you know, for, for weeks afterward, you know, uh, dominating the, the coverage, you know, counting how many pages were devoted to, to the story um, and, and noting when, when it actually out of, you know, out of the New York Times, when that actually started to to go down, it'd be interesting to look back and see, you know, uh, how many pages were devoted to it on day one versus day ten versus a month after, two months after, et cetera. Uh, when was it off the front page, for example? Uh, recent uh, front pages, what I've seen is every story is around coronavirus, yeah. but at the same time, um, there are uh, significant stories that are are still being told, and I know Shri did a show on his uh, COVID-19 show, his daily show, um, talking about the news that you might have missed. Here, the New York Times is doing a special two-page spread with some incredible photography. Um, if you look at um, these pictures here on the screen um, of uh, indigenous people in, in Brazil, where the president there, Bolsonaro, covets the wealth of indigenous people and derides the people um, so, so it's just good to note that the New York Times is still paying attention to these stories as well. Um, it was also interesting that uh, the uh, Yamamami tribe in uh, the Amazon, a famously isolated tribe, had their first coron coronavirus case. 
uh, which is really uh, uh, interesting. Uh, speaking of Michigan, um, this is the governor uh, of Michigan here. Um, the, the woman in Michigan, apparently, as, as yeah. uh, some on the right are referring to her. That um, woman, Gretchen Whitmer, that's her name. We ought to know that woman's name, Gretchen Whitmer. She's doing a really good job. Yeah, and here's a shot of the militia um, uh, you know, amassing on the steps. It looks like the steps of the Capitol there. Yeah. Um, it, it is, she's quelling a right-wing revolt is what the subhead uh, references. And um, you know, she's being uh, mentioned as a potential VP uh, nominee as well. Um, so that is, that is also very interesting. Uh, one thing I want to give uh, New York Times a shout out for uh, giving free access to the Times for uh, every high school in America. Uh, they have a whole uh, a section. Uh, you can go to NewYorkTimes.com uh, slash high school access to learn more. Um, uh, a number of people are feeding hospitals and uh, helping restaurants. Um, and I know you know, here's the uh, obituaries uh, uh, page. The New York Times has a number of obituaries online uh, of the people who uh, died from coronavirus, and they have a really great thread of uh, uh, stories related to that as well. Um, so we'll look for folks outside of New York. If you're used to Shreve uh, doing the show, the national edition only shows two, um, uh, two uh, uh, pages for the New York section. There's a whole section uh, when you're in New York. Uh, we have a, a question from one of our viewers, uh, Rosemary, so I'm going to go with to that. Um, we have a question from a Sri Srinivasan watching on Facebook. Uh, Sri, uh, thank you for your question. Um, and uh, I'm going to let uh, Rosemary tackle this one. What does, going back, I was just about to ask a question, what does Judge Rosemary uh, Aquilina think of her fellow judge, Janine Pirro, uh, who is on Fox News? Uh, would you care to uh, speak to that? And you know, Jennifer I, Lazarus would like to know, too. Um, I haven't watched her a whole lot because I'm usually working, and um, I don't tend to watch and comment on, on other judges, so I, I guess I can answer a specific question if they have a concern, but, you know, it's really difficult for me to comment on other judges. Um, I try not to do that unless there's something overwhelmingly um, uh, that, I, that, that rubs me the wrong way or that I would do differently, but... Um, I, so I, is there a specific question? Because well, I'm happy I'll to offer, answer. Uh, the, the background, uh, Janine Pirro uh, was a judge actually out of uh, Westchester in New York where I grew up. Um, but I think she's uh, uh, more of a uh, commentator on Fox News now. Um, and uh, the question might be more about, you know, kind of her, her, her uh, role in the Fox media universe. Um, but maybe we'll turn our attention to a, a question from Nancy. Uh, why do you think these militia protests get more ink and more focus than the huge marches against uh, uh, Donald Trump? You know, that's a really good question, and I, I have to wonder about that. But I think that they're really speaking to those people who want to get back to work. And people are anxious, and they want something to focus on and to tell them when this is going to change. And I think that the people who are going to the Capitol, whether it's it's uh, in Michigan or, or in any, any other state, they're really saying, you know, we want to be heard. And I don't think they're feeling heard by um, Trump. And they're hoping that maybe the local government will talk to Trump. And if they make a, a big enough noise, something will change. The problem with all of that thinking is, the, how can we have a conversation with the coronavirus when we don't even know how it attacks? We are dealing with an enemy here that they don't have any weapons to fight against except to stay home, to stay safe, to wash our hands, to do all of those protocols that the medical community has said. And it's it's easy to get angry about staying home and not being able to, to work. But you can't work if you're dead. And we all need to work together. This is a time where it's not Republican and Democrat. This is a time where we should be joining together and not having those uh, rallies. There should be something about how do we work together to solve the problem, not how do we fight against each other because we want a paycheck. And I do understand people need to eat. I do understand that there's poverty and other things going on, especially now. 
Uh, I'm going to have to work until I'm 205 because I think my retirement's probably gone. But I am glad to be living. I'm glad to have my family safe. And I hope they stay that way. But if we keep doing what we're doing by having these rallies on the steps where we're unprotected and uh, causing problems for those who are trying to make solutions, that's just not the way to do it. What we need to do is partner together for solutions. I, I, I think that's a great point and, and really appreciate that. Um, you know, we have a number of other questions. I want to bring in a question from Noah Pomerantz, uh, who is another friend of mine from Hastings on Hudson, went to high school with him. Uh, but he's asking about the backlog of uh, cases um, from all the levels and, and catching up to back to normal um, and, and domestic crimes here in the D.C. area as well. What do, what do you think is going to take to get through that backlog? Uh, you know, the judges, we're all having that same conversation. I know that I meet weekly with my staff and go over my docket and there are a number of things that we can do. For example, and if you just think about it logically, when, when I have a trial in front of me that might last three weeks, that's three weeks of my time where I'm not hearing other cases. So one of the things that I'm going to do, and I think other judges will probably do the same, is have a couple of weeks where we're just hearing those motions that get us to trial, where we're just having pretrials, where we're doing things that actually speed up the cases. And I think prosecutors are going to have to take a long, hard look at what cases they want to move forward on, maybe dismiss a few, maybe offer some pleas they wouldn't ordinarily do until later on in the game, offer the real deal up front. Because oftentimes, especially in criminal cases, they offer the, the best deal the day of trial, and that might be a year out. So I think prosecutors really have to take a hard look at the evidence and say, what's the best deal? Offer it, um, or else just set it on the trial docket. Um, it is going to take, take some time, but that's why we are working remotely from home. We're not waiting. So we're taking the worst first. And I can't tell you that um, there isn't going to be a backlog because that would be silly. We, there is going to be a backlog. We're just all tackling it the best that we can. Sure. Uh, if, if it takes me to do night, night court or weekend court, I'm happy to do that. I don't know about my staff, but we may end up looking at some... Uh, compromises here in terms of how do we get all the cases heard? Uh, you know, I'm open for ideas, but I can tell you we're working around the clock to make sure that everybody has their day in court and victims are heard and defendants have justice as well. Uh, and Andrea is, is sharing your statement, leave your pain and go out and do your magnificent things. Uh, went deep for every person who's ever been affected by Me Too and still means so much to her personally. So thank you for yeah. that. Um, there was a, a question from Sally earlier uh, about what um, what your favorite charities are um, that she wants to donate in your honor. Uh, in your honor. Yeah. Gosh. Um, you know, one of my favorite charities is the uh, Dyslexia Fund, the Dyslexia Institute. And I'll tell you why. We have so many children who get lost and who get treated differently for, for a lot of different reasons. But when you have dyslexia, um, the insurance doesn't cover it. Children can't get tested. And all we have to do is teach them differently. And I contribute every year to the um, Dyslexic Institute because those children don't have to get lost. And those children are so damned intelligent. We just have to teach them differently. And that's one of my favorite funds. Um, I have a, a lot of different funds, but I like to give to those funds that uh, use the money wisely and that change the world one person at a time. And I have to give a shout out to Sally Roberts because she is wrestle with a girl. I don't know if any of you know her, but she is absolutely incredible. She joined a, and you might want to have her on your show at some point. She was, uh, I think it was in, in uh, what, eighth or ninth grade. She decided to, um, she was uh, getting into a lot of trouble. I don't want to really tell her story, but, and she decided that she was going to be, on the boys wrestling team. And she was really the first girl on the boys wrestling team. And she did magnificent things. And ultimately I got almost up to the um, Olympics and then she joined the military and her story is incredible. And she has started wrestle with a girl, uh, wrestle like a girl. I'm sorry. It's a foundation. And she has brought strength and joy to so many children and just humans. She's a great person. 
Um, and I would like to uh, put you in touch with, uh, speaking of charities, we have a really great United Way chapter in uh, um, uh, Lansing, a uh, capital area United Way. Uh, they're not chapters per se, but uh, our local United Way, completely independent. Um, but I'll put you in touch with some of my colleagues there as well. They're doing some really important work. Uh, I wanna uh, bring in a comment from Cornelius uh, Stig from Twitter, um, uh, who, uh, who we're waiting for it to come up as a survivor, remain grateful for the outcome of the Nasser case and the documentation in the book um, and, and again, we, as we talked about that earlier, what it means for survivors uh, and what it means for, for men uh, to speak out and, and share their truth uh, as well. Um, I say, and Neil and Cornelius, I have to thank you. You, you two are our heroes talking about your abuse. It is a really, really difficult, um, amazingly difficult thing for men to talk about abuse because our society looks at men as you're always strong and in fact makes it really tough for you to report and to um, show that weakness. So you two are heroes and all the men. This is not rape. Sexual assault is not a woman's crime. It's a human crime. It's a, a crime against women and men and boys and girls. And it has to be recognized as such. And we need to partner together to resolve it. Um, there's a question from, th thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Um, Doug is asking, uh, what was your two word response that Harold uh, Tobin liked so much? Do you know? Oh, Harold, uh, the, the, it, it, um, I don't remember. It was Coben. Um, you, I think you, did you look it up? I, I, uh, Kinney oh, and he's about talking the, about the beer, the beer. Yeah. He was asking about, uh, uh, what drinks. And there was a lager that I had found that I thought was fun and Kinney, which is a drink in Malta, which is, uh, I don't know that we have one like it here, but it's kind of like a Dr. Pepper, but it's, it's just very different. And so uh, I'll ask uh, our producers to, to look that up. If they search on Twitter for Rosemary and Harlan Coben, they can put that in the comments and, and share that. Um, yeah. I do want to turn turn back to the paper. There's a really great session that uh, I want to look at with you, the America we need. Um, this special pullout section, this is from the New York Times opinion uh, uh, from the editorial board. Um, from some of its darkest hours, the United States has emerged stronger. Just to look at the package they put together in this this front this first section, um, if you can see this two page spread, the America we need, uh, you can't quite miss that that headline. Um, and uh, this piece by James Bennett, uh, we're planning an inequality project. We were planning an inequality project, and then history lurched. Um, and so you see kind of how they they laid this out. Um, lots of charts and graphs. America will struggle after the coronavirus. These charts show why. Uh, so that that whole question about when we can get back to work and when we can uh, um, uh, you know, get back to some kind of normal. Uh, domestic workers need your help and you need ours. Uh, the story about this woman who was fired because of the coronavirus. Um, uh, Melissa St. Helier is a home care aide. Uh, so a big shout out to home care workers. Uh, before joining United Way, uh, when I was in Washington State, I worked with uh, SEIU 775, the Home Care Workers Union, uh, home care workers and nursing home workers, uh, two people who have been hit particularly hard by coronavirus. Um, and uh, these are people who um, are vulnerable themselves, uh, not in the best of health to begin with, uh, but they're taking care of our, our seniors, people with uh, disabilities, um, you know, sometimes family members, but more often than not, um, they're helping people who can't uh, take care of themselves. Um, so my heart goes out to them as well. This other piece, the coronavirus, like earlier plagues, could shift the balance between rich and poor. Um, as we flip through this, uh, just interesting design work too. If you take a look, uh, and hopefully you can tell the red font, large uh, headlines uh, with a red font highlight, um, addressing climate change is a big enough idea to revive the economy. Uh, the crisis is changing how Americans view one another. And then some incredible photography as well. Um, the idea is that won't survive the coronavirus. Um, and so in this great shot here, um, and I think Viet uh, Thanh Nguyen is a, uh, is a contributing uh, opinion writer 
is the author of a book called The Refugees. So I certainly encourage people to check this out online. Uh, I'm sure it's in the, uh, this is the America we need. Paula is sharing the link uh, with folks and you can see it online um, on the screen. Uh, why the coronavirus is killing African-Americans more than others. That's a huge issue as well. And, and again, a reference to work, uh, the BET is doing a special on Wednesday uh, this week and uh, United Way is working closely with them on that effort uh, to raise uh, um, uh, money and support for African-American communities who have been hit particularly hard. Um, that parenting section I was telling you about earlier, uh, Rosemary, you're a parent as well, right? Um, what, what are some of the challenges that you've uh, uh, dealt with? Uh, During this virus, it's, uh, well, the children do not want to do homework. Um, they're yeah. not as well there's a lot of energy that's just cooped up that even if you say well let's just go walk down the street it's still it's not enough and they're really missing their friends so we've done some zoom chats we have a family zoom chat we have a friend zoom chat with the children with their friends and so keeping them connected and occupied and keeping them to cook and we're doing some different things we might not otherwise do so I'm trying to use it as quality time not fighting time but it can be it can be very challenging. But I, wa I want to shout out, uh, first of all, to the United Way. I agree to do some tremendous work um, in our community and just around the United States. But in terms of the paper that you are uh, pulling up, the New York Times does a, a great job. And they're not just reporting on the coronavirus, as you've pointed out, so many other things. And I think that with the coronavirus, it's on the news. It's My, my 10-year-old has washed his hands so many times his eczema has flared up because he's watching the news and it's always horrific. So I think we should point out as well that people need to have self-care and step away from it. So re if you're reading the New York Times, there's so much in it. You know, read the coronavirus and then go to something else and give your mind a break from it. Turn off the television for a while on the coronavirus because I think that it is causing some people to have, you know, triggering events and it will end. It's just a question of, you know, pacing yourself with all that news. There, there is a lot of news uh, to cover and, and there are some really great issues, uh, articles in this parent section. I certainly encourage people, you know, people teaching at home suddenly how to set work boundaries. I actually organized a call for my my daughter uh, last Friday with friends of hers uh, on Zoom from her class so they can connect with each other. She's had individual calls, but this was the first group call. Um, and then how to soothe anxiety uh, with with your kids. Um, you're right. There is a lot, uh, a lot in the paper around coronavirus. Um, and, and there's a lot that, um, you know, we a lot, a lot of other stories to consider. Um, there's a piece on Amazon in the Sunday business section. Uh, as Amazon rises, so does the uh, uh, opposition. Uh, the book review is always interesting as well, um, yeah, especially in this time. Books make great company. Uh, people are, are obviously a lot of people are trying to read online now. If they can't get to the library, can't get to their bookstores. Um, the arts and leisure section has a special, uh, the lost voices of war. And Frank listened in, in Amsterdam attic to the voice of the Dutch uh, education minister on the radio. Um, and these are some of the uh, uh, artifacts uh, from that, um, that era as well. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is uh, take a moment as we start uh, wrapping up the first section of uh, today's read along. Um, I wanna turn our attention to the magazine, um, which has a, it's a photo essay inside New York City's hospitals as they face the pandemic. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and watch, this is the cover, but we're going to watch a video of how they made the cover. Uh, so go ahead and uh, start that, Shree. And uh, we'll have to uh, play the audio. Um, we may need to restart that. Let's see if we can uh, restart that, uh, Shree, and share the audio. And Just 30 seconds. I think everyone would be staying home. From the New York Times Magazine. This is behind the cover. The magazine this week is dedicated to stories and photographs from inside New York City's hospitals as the pandemic hit. Our photo department sent Philip Montgomery, an extraordinary photojournalist, to document what's happening in a number of the public hospitals in the city. 
as we're learning around the country and certainly in New York, the pandemic is disproportionately affecting people of color and low income residents of major municipalities in New York City. Many of those people are served by the city's public hospital system, the largest in the country. This was a pretty dangerous assignment. There was a lot of risk involved in it. Not only was Philip having to protect himself and his assistant, both of whom were wearing full PPE, but they're also having to observe a whole bunch of regulations about patient privacy. One of the things that's really powerful about the photographs that Philip took are that you really feel like you're right inside the hospital with him. The reason that we have these photos is that our photo desk worked tirelessly to gain access to this hospital system. And then, of course, because Philip had the courage and the presence of mind to be there and see what he saw and record it as he did as a photojournalist. To actually see it, patients in the hospital, and of course, and women, fellow New Yorkers, that you ride the train with every day, who are terrified everything's trying to change for me and understanding what we're up against, what the system was up against. The way that I'm seeing the world now is it's very different. The image that we chose for the cover is of a patient being intubated at Queens Hospital. One of the reasons we chose the cover was because it really shows the life-saving efforts by healthcare workers. Yeah. We really feel a sense of responsibility to create a document or a record of what's happening. It's a moment in history. There's a lot of people who don't take this crisis seriously. And when you see a whole emergency room of people hooked up to ventilators, and when you see doctors intubating a patient, I think it helps readers and general public understand this is a very, very serious disease. That was the uh, uh, behind the cover video of the New York Times uh, Magazine. Uh, thank you, Shree, for pulling that up. Uh, doing a great job as our executive producer today. Uh, a little bit of role reversal. Um, I want to show the uh, the pictures in here um, so you get a sense of what it looks like uh, in, uh, in print. Uh, so we'll just turn to that real quickly. Um, video ended faster than I thought it would. Uh, so let's see if I can find that. Here we go. So what an incredible way a design uh, choice. Um, starting it off, just a little bit of text in the top left, photographs by Philip Montgomery, text by Jonathan Mahler, and then just the epicenter uh, in the middle of the page, uh, very uh, minimalist. Um, a two-page spread. dominant photos I mean, this is really the power of print this is why you know we we've done the new york times read along for sheree has done it for five years and i've helped for about uh two and a half years it's a celebration of print it's a celebration of of how you present news um and you know we we do take advantage of, of technology we do take advantage of uh, the ability to show video like we did uh, but there's nothing, nothing beats the power of, of print. I mean, looking at, look at this photo, full two page spread. That's, that's the tablecloth behind it. That's framing uh, that white, but that is all photograph uh, right there over, over two pages. Um, so just incredible work. And, and this, I think was on the cover. This, uh, this wasn't the cover. This was in the video though, um, moving people. Uh, so it gives you a sense of, of how they laid it out. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it with that. Uh, and, uh, again, just to, uh, thank everyone, uh, for joining us. If you're joining us late or, or if you, um, just need a reminder, uh, judge Rosemary Aquilina, uh, is our guest today. Uh, she is, uh, uh, the judge who presided over the Larry Nasser case, uh, the USA gymnastics, uh, sex scandal, but, um, She's also an author herself, uh, True Crime. Uh, she has um, you know, served in the National Guard uh, in Michigan and um, you know, just was a phenomenal guest today talking about the impact of coronavirus on the judicial system, uh, on uh, the concerns uh, around people dealing with uh, domestic violence and, and abuse, uh, looking at the impact that uh, coronavirus has had on her personal life, on her family, um, you know, Laura is saying, making a comment, um, and I think about the video, making it so vivid, New York Times profile of Joe Joyce, uh, the owner of J.J. Bubbles in, in Bay Ridge, uh, saw that article, he was 
uh, a bar owner um, that uh, took a cruise and ended up dying. Um, there's so many great uh, 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 comments. Uh, we had Abigail Pesta join us as well. There's uh, our friend Sonny Slaughter. Um, uh, Sonny, hopefully you'll be able to go back and watch uh, uh, earlier parts of the show. But um, again, Sonny was our guest on the New York Times read along 1619 project, which is a very special uh, show that we did. Um, so I wanted to, to make sure in, in, in honor of your, your comment, uh, Rosemary, as uh, even though that uh, a lot of the focus has been on um, coronavirus, uh, I want to uh, have some, some bit of normalcy uh, as possible. Uh, we actually read the poem uh, at the end of our show. Um, and uh, this is not the end of our show. This is the end of our first segment. Um, but one of the things that we do is read the poem um, cold, uh, not knowing. Uh, Sheree's point is that poems really should be read by the author because they understand the, uh, the, the cadence and the timing and, and the, where the emphasis should be. You should never read them cold. But we do it anyway because we want to celebrate poetry. And um, I want to take uh, to heart what you said earlier um, that there's other things in the paper. There are other issues that we should talk about. So I'm going to uh, read the poem, and then I'm going to ask you to offer some last thoughts before we uh, uh, move on with our discussion. Uh, hopefully, we'll have Dr. Albert Jahari join us uh, shortly uh, to talk about um, COVID-19 and some of these issues from a medical perspective. Uh, so here is the uh, poem, and we'll go ahead and, and make the, um, make this bigger for folks to see on the screen. Um, I gave my love a story by Tess Taylor. Um, the intro by Naomi Shahab Nye. Could anyone use a lullaby? I'm sure the poet Tess Taylor never guessed the word virus would become the center of a season. Uh, I guess we can't get too far away from, from uh, uh, coronavirus. Uh, but how are they wise? No one could question the way old lullabies bounce back into mind when a new generation rolls around or a need arises. In Taylor, um, uh, or a need arises. In Taylor's stunning new book, Rift Zone, we are faced with the unsteadiness of our current universe, the many minor scales unfurling inside our days, as well as ways of feeling connected through time and trouble. I gave my love a story by Tess Taylor. Now it is night again, child on my chest. I croon uh, and my song drifts you toward rest. As I chant in darkness, um, you are also learning to hear minor scales chime and forts falling. Together we hover inside a melody many dead mothers once sung before. Tonight the cherry still has no stone. Tonight I rock you out of bodily memory. And these songs are older than we are. And this tune I hum is wise as a virus. It makes me a vector for rhythm and cadence. Tonight, the chicken still has no bone. The song lives on, persists, and persists. That's uh, this week's poem uh, by Tess Taylor, chosen by Naomi Shahab Nye. Uh, and um, that's how we traditionally will would close the, uh, the read-along. Uh, but of course, in this instance, uh, this is just the end of uh, our first uh, segment. Um, I would like to ask uh, Rosemary if you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us um, before we uh, uh, transition. We'll bring Shri on. We'll thank our sponsors, et cetera. But um, what, what would you like to share with people who are watching? I just want to thank you for having me at this important time and to tell people to stay safe and really don't overdo the news and make sure that you use this time as a valuable time with your family as you're locked in. I know in my own house there's some yelling and screaming and fighting because we are too close, but uh, in too close a quarters, but this is going to pass. And what I'm trying to do is stay hopeful, look outside and spend this time as time that I will never have back with my children because I'm usually working and now I am spending some quality time every single day and counting blessings, not shortcomings. And I think we all need to do that because this is a time when people are worried about bills and retirement accounts and all of that. But you know what? We're still here and we need to work together for a solution and to be safe and knowing that the future only holds brightness. 
And we're going to come together out of this stronger than ever because we are Americans and that is what we do. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rosemary. Really appreciate it. Uh, and um, thank you again for joining us today. Uh, we have uh, our host, Shri, uh, Shri Basu, joining us uh, on the uh, on the screen. Shri, thank you so much for uh, your support. Personally, uh, in the run up to this week, uh, this was a very important uh, show for us to do and, and very uh, personally, um, uh, very meaningful. Uh, so thank you for your uh, encouragement and uh, advice along the way and, and for uh, doing some executive production work this morning. Not as well as you, Neil. You did such a great job. You do such a great job every week. It was funny to be on the other side of this. Uh, to say to you, Neil, you are an amazing friend. And for you to share, uh, it's very hard for men to share, Judge Aquilina. It's very hard for Indian men to share yeah. uh, any any trauma of any yeah. kind, any trouble. We're always expected to be perfect. And uh, Neil did, uh, as when he first shared this on a previous show about being a survivor himself, it was so moving for so many of us in the community and uh, not just the read-along community, but also the Indian community in particular to see that yeah. men can be sensitive and men can share and talk about our, our troubles. So Neil, we're always grateful to you for that. And if that's one of the only legacies of the New York Times read-along, I'll always be grateful that that happened. And uh, Judge Aquilina, thank you. You are a rock star. Uh, you are a hero of mine and of so many people, as you saw in the comments. I hope you'll get a chance to go into the comments. I also want a chance for our doctor to say hello to you, and then we'll transition out. Our doctor's watching from Atlanta, as you, as as people on the read along know. We usually end around now. Neil's usually trying to get me off the air right about now, and so we talk to our producers and our guests, and uh, we decided that we're always going to have medical segment because uh, at least during this crisis so that doctors can come in and speak to us and take your questions it also shows you that with all the information in the world and as the judge said you know there's so much news getting accurate information is so important uh, by the way if you're not a subscriber to my newsletter a newsletter went out this morning every sunday i send out something called a sunday note and that should be in your inbox if you haven't seen it that means you're not a subscriber please email me sri at sri.net would love to add you I write one uh, newsletter every Sunday with lots of great tips. Uh, so let's bring on the judge and uh, and uh, Al and our Dr. Albert Johari together, so I can just say hi to them. Uh, hello, uh, Dr. Johari from Emory. Hey, Good from morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, I know you got a chance to see the show so far. Well, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much, Judge, for your insight and for for everything that you've done. Um, uh, you know, it's an inspiration. Thank you. And uh, Judge, we will let you go. We know when we need to get back to your day. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to reading your novels and uh, keeping in touch. Uh, you want to remind everybody how they can find you, where they can find you? I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Um, just look at me up in the Ingham County Courthouse. I, I, I will respond. I just want to say on your comment about men of culture, it is terribly difficult to talk. We need to have a different conversation on that and free your voices up. And we all need to join together in that. I just wanna say as my closing, uh, a mantra that I try to teach everybody, I have a voice, I am victorious. And then you put them together, I matter. So for everybody out there who's struggling, I have a voice, I am victorious, I matter, I am powerful. I'll leave you with that message and thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, what a great, thank What you, a great Jeff. closing. Rosemary, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, as as we turn our attention to uh, uh, Dr. Johari, um, you know, Shri, uh, tell me, should we thank our sponsors? Yes, I'm going to just do our th uh, sponsor. Thank you, and then the uh, the doc is going to get ready for a barrage of questions that we have. Neil's going to run the rest of the show with him, but just want to say to everyone, thank you so much for watching. It's really uh, an honor to have this New York Times community of viewers, readers. Uh, we want to do more of these, and we can do these only if we continue to have the great support of all of you. So thank you for sharing. Uh, we are so grateful. Let's uh, also thank our sponsors. Our sponsors make it possible for us to have a great show with great production, and we really appreciate them. So let me thank our three sponsors who we have. We want to thank 
uh, Strategy Focus Group, SFG, is a global team of human capital strategists committed to helping organizations solve people issues within your organization. They do that by working alongside you to solve your toughest problems and helping you capture your greatest opportunities. We're going to share with you the specific URLs that will uh, make sure that our links are clicked on by all of you. The more clicks we get, the more support we show our donors, our sponsors. So please watch for that inside the Facebook group. We're gonna share that. We really, really appreciate your being here. Uh, let me also thank our other sponsor, Muckrack, which helps you discover news as it breaks, easily generate reports, and explore the work of journalists, podcasters, bloggers, and more. Muckrack software helps PR teams build stronger relationships with the media. And if you're a journalist, you might also be eligible for their free tools to identify trends and showcase your work. I'm also honored to say that I am now a, an advisor to Muckrack. So thank you very much for your support of the read along. And we also want to thank Tweepsmap, which helps you build personalized relationships with your audience with focused, straightforward, actionable analytics and an all in one intelligent publishing platform. At the end of the show, we're going to show you some analytics from the past month to give you a sense of how popular this show is. And that's going to come to you from Tweeps Map. And also thank you to Ron, uh, to Ron Thomas of Strategy Focus Group, Greg Gallant and Mike Schneider from Muckrack and Samir Albatron from Tweeps Map for your support of the New York Times Read Along. If you're interested in sponsoring the Read Along, please contact me, Sri at Sri.net, S-R-E-E at sree.net or our executive producer, Neil Parekh. So please do email us, neil at neilparekh.org uh, is his uh, handle. And uh, I think we're ready now to take your questions. Please send us your questions about medical issues. One thing I do wanna say and to remind everyone that I have a daily a program that I was gonna say daily show, a daily global conference call I'd started as, and now it's a show that's had more than 350,000 viewers in the last 37 days, every day, a show about COVID-19. Tonight is our positivity night, 9 p.m. Eastern, every Sunday. And today we have a fabulous guest, Tal Ben-Shahar, who has taught happiness, and he's co-founder of the Happiness Academic, uh, uh, Happiness Studies Ac Academy. And he's the professor who's taught the two of the largest classes in the history of Harvard University about psychology and happiness. Please tune in 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we want you to be there with us. And then I have been recommending to everybody the importance of working on something during this time. You heard the judge tell us how she's spending more time with her family. Well, all of us can work on some kind of digital project and we are gonna help you work on your Twitter this time. So if you're on Twitter, you wanna up your Twitter game, you wanna maybe get a Twitter account, we're gonna do that 4.30 p.m. Eastern on Monday. 4.30 p.m. Eastern on Monday. Two questions I get that is relevant to all of this. Number one, why is my show, unlike the New York Times Read Along, which is always at 8.30 and Neil has done such a great job with that, why is my show all over the place, The Daily Show? And the reason is that uh, unlike this show, we're, you know, we're just getting started there. And I wanna be able to say to some of the most interesting, biggest names in the world, join me at any time in the next 20 days rather than trying to pin them down. So that gives me great flexibility. We have amazing world famous people who are gonna be joining us, including Joe Lockhart, the former press secretary to Bill Clinton, who's, going, who's amazing. And the, the editor in chief of the Wall Street Journal will be joining us as well. So stay tuned for that. And the other question I get, and this ties directly to Dr. Johari as well, why do we not see more nurses on my show, on TV, and the read along. And the answer to that I've discovered is that hospitals do media training for doctors and doctors are often seen as more kind of on the management side and uh, nurses as more frontline workers. That's not always the case everywhere, but that's a distinction. The other part is that a lot of doctors are in private practice and they can decide for themselves if they wanna go on TV or be available to the press. Whereas nurses aren't typically in that same situation where they're, they have their own small business to do that. So that's one of the reasons, but we would love to have nurses on. So if you know a nurse who could come on our show, either on my programming that we do every day, or you want to come uh, on our show uh, here on the read along where the last half hour, 45 minutes on every Sunday, uh, we will talk about medical issues. We would be very grateful 
Uh, we had a nurse on our WBAI show, which is my spin-off radio show here in New York, and she was terrific. Melody Butler, at Melody Butler, was amazing, so we might have her on. So over to you, Neil. Doctor, thank you so much for all you and your colleagues do for us, your community, your city, your country, and the planet. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Shri. Appreciate that. Um, uh, Dr. Johari, uh, um, wanted to, to start off, we heard from uh, um, uh, Rosemary about telejustice effectively, how they're doing uh, uh, judicial proceedings online. Uh, how has is, how is this impacted your um, practice? And, and before we even get there, you know, we, we, we do wanna know about your personal situation how are you doing? How are you doing with family? Um, you know, what what are what's happening in your personal life before we ask about work? Yeah, appreciate you having me on. Uh, first off, Neil, um, uh, we're using a lot more uh, telehealth these days, obviously, because we're trying to only see patients in the office that uh, have emergent needs. Um, so we're doing a lot more telehealth. I actually love it, and it's like visiting with a friend. The patients love it also. Um, kind of the same reason they feel like their doctor's making a house call to them. So it's more of an intimate uh, interaction. And I've actually, I'm learning along with them how much you actually can do with telehealth. Um, I actually had a patient that had abdominal pain and I was wondering why the staff put that patient in for a telehealth visit. It's not usually the ideal medium for that, but we were able to actually um, uh, maneuver our ways through it. I could you know, tell her an instructor where to press on her abdomen and did it hurt? You know, obviously I couldn't listen to her abdomen, but there's other questions you can ask to make sure everything's um, working. Is she having bowel movements, et cetera? And um, so we're actually able to maneuver through it and prevent her from going to the hospital, which would have uh, put her at risk, you know, um, possibly put other people at risk. Um, this individual actually uh, was a self pay patient. So it helped her financially also at the same time. So um, I love it. it, you know, we're gonna definitely continue this trend um, going forward. Uh, I never used telehealth prior to uh, this crisis, um, but it's definitely gonna be part of our everyday going forward. That's, that's great. Um, we do have a, a couple of questions coming in. Uh, so we'll start with one from uh, Philip Arlen. Uh, are there any promising treatments for COVID-19? Is that something you've been tracking? Okay, absolutely. Um, there's no obviously approved uh, treatments as of yet, um, but there's a lot of uh, promise with uh, hydroxychloroquine, uh, Zithromax and other modalities. Again, it hasn't been proven, uh, but there's um, some studies, uh, quite a few studies actually that show using these uh, uh, two chemicals uh, early on can show a pretty good benefit. Um, there are people that are using it off label meaning that it's not FDA approved for this, but using an off-label for prophylaxis. Um, there's also a recent um, study from Emory, it's actually ongoing on uh, Redemivir, which is a antiviral drug that was used um, for Ebola. And uh, you know, those, those are the two ones that are getting a lot of traction right now. That's great, uh, thank you. Um, one of the questions, uh, uh, one of the things that we talked about with um, uh, Rosemary is the uh, um, concern about uh, domestic violence and uh, people in abusive situations. Um, you know, from as a as a medical professional, can you talk us through that a little bit? What what in your estimation uh, is potentially happening in in people's homes? Uh, how are how are people? Um, you know, how is this affecting people? Um, yeah, 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 absolutely. Mentally. Well, we know we're social beings, you know, um, we're social beings. We're not meant to be confined to a house, you know, uh, for hours on end. And uh, everybody reacts to uh, stress differently. Um, if you're one who's predisposed to violence and anger, one who's predisposed to, um, you know, domestic abuse, now you have the opportunity because you're confined together for prolonged periods um, Whereas um, uh, the opportunities there, in other words, um, uh, you know, stress can do a lot of damaging effects, uh, you know, to an individual. That's why, you know, there's a push toward getting people back to the workplace. You know, obviously we want to do it very safely, but staying at home for months on end is really 
has got so many negative ramifications. Um, stress can lead to changes in your sleep and eating patterns. Um, fear and worry about yourself. Fear and worry about your loved ones. Um, difficulty concentrating. Um, uh, people that have a tendency to use drugs and alcohol will increase their use of tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. Um, you know, if you're taking care of a loved one that's older, for instance, um, uh, you got double, du you got a double whammy. You got to take care of yourself. You're already stressed about that. And now you're having to take care of somebody else that's got, that's pretty needy um, in a lot of, a lot of cases. Um, so that adds to stress. Um, so, um, uh, you know, the opportunity and just the fact that the stress levels have been heightened, you know, can lead to more domestic violence and uh, child abuse, you know, due to increased opportunity, increased stress. Uh, and and Philip has a follow up uh, uh, to that. There's a lot of buzz around antibody tests. Um, how do we know if we have uh, uh, COVID-19 antibodies that we won't get infected? I assume that's what uh, he's meaning to type. Um, can you speak to and that's, that's also the, the need to ramp up testing, et cetera. Um, right. So, so currently right now, what we have in, in the uh, workplace, I am a primary care doctor uh, who was doing testing um, up until recently. We still do it, but we do it less often because initially it was either our office or the hospital. And obviously we didn't want to inundate the hospital. So we were doing our duty. A lot of my colleagues and friends thought I was crazy. You know, you're putting yourself at risk. You're putting your staff at risk. You know, but that's what we signed up for. We went to medical school. So um, uh, I didn't really think too much of that. Um, uh, we did get the proper equipment, um, everything but the face face shield, to be honest with you. But um, uh, but I think we had the appropriate equipment to be able to do that. Um, when the drive by testing centers opened, then you had another avenue um, that was safer, quicker. Um, actually, the results uh, turned around quicker also um, from the uh drive by. So, um, so we shifted more to that. If I'm seeing somebody in my office that I think needs to be tested, I do have the equipment. Um, uh, my, my nurses and myself tested ourselves. Um, it's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> uh, they stick a, uh, long, uh, uh, a swab all the way up your nose, almost to your brain, uh, and swab it around for a little bit. And then they do the other side. So, um, uh, wow. Uh, uh, all of us uh, had tears afterwards, um, but um, but that's what we had. Now they have the saliva test and uh, those tests just tell, do you have it at this time? Right. There's a lot of uh, uh, talk about testing, testing, testing. Since we're quarantined now, testing is not as important. It's important, but not as important because the answer is if you're not really ill, if your test is positive, we're going to quarantine you for two weeks. If your test is negative, you're supposed to be quarantined anyway by the government and state mandates. Um, but to answer Phil's question, um, the real key, in my opinion, is the antibody tests. The, the, uh, to go back to the other tests, it just tells whether you have it at that moment. And, and I tell my staff, you could leave the office and contract it on your way home through, mm -hmm. through, through grocery store, through pumping gas. Um, it, you know, there's uh, evidence that, uh, the virus can actually stay on objects, inanimate objects for, for periods of time. But the antibody test would tell us whether we've been exposed, right? And whether we have immunity. And um, uh, with the antibody tests, um, we'll, I think that would make it much easier for us to transition back into society um, because there would be a sense of comfort. Um, we're now finding out it may not be 100%. And there's been some studies over in Asia or, or I'm sorry, some instances over in Asia where people tested negative and then uh, a few days later they got tested again and they were positive. Um, so what they're recommending now that you get two tests that are negative before going back, that's the regular testing. And um, uh, they're thinking maybe the reason for the secondary um, positivity could be dead particles. So it may not be a reinfection, but again, we don't know what it's all, all new, but the mm -hmm. antibody tests are going to be the key is the key to go back because that would tell us whether you're immune. And, and the thoughts are there are much more people that have had this and didn't realize they had it because maybe they had mild GI symptoms. Maybe they didn't have respiratory symptoms. Maybe they had mild rep respiratory symptoms and their body fought it off. So, you know, that, you know, time will tell. And, and we have a question from Patricia uh, Freudenberg from LinkedIn. Um, she was asking, are there any statistics on blood type behavior in response to contracting COVID-19? Yeah, um, yeah, I'm not the expert on that. I have read something like that, like O positive, you know, was less risk. 
you know, thank God I've got O positive blood, but, it, but again, I'm not the expert on that. So I really can't comment from a, um, an expert sure. standpoint. Um, Mark is asking, you know, and, and agrees that we're very social. We talked about that earlier. Um, do you think we'll be in a less social world uh, after COVID, you know, thinking about large uh, gatherings, picnics, festivals, sporting events, uh, cruises, um, you know, what, yeah. what, and, and it's similar to, you know, Philip is also asking, when do you think a stay at home rules can be relaxed? Uh, okay. What is your sense? We looked at the New York Times earlier. They were talking about, you know, what does it look like a year from now? And longer. Um, yeah, well, I'll be honest. In the future. Yeah, I'm. I'm very optimistic. I, I really. really? I, my nature, and 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 that just from what I've seen, um, I'm thinking. I'm here in Georgia. Uh, we're kind of reaching our peak right now. Um, uh, uh, two different statistics. One shows we're re reaching our peak. One shows we're close to it. Um, uh, but um, I'm thinking in three, four, five weeks in Atlanta. Every city is different. Every place is different. You know, Omaha, Nebraska is different than New York City. But I think in three or four weeks, time will tell, we'll be able to start transitioning back it, you, you get in, it, very slowly and very carefully. It will not be business as usual. Right. So we're still going to be wearing masks. We're still going to be keeping our distances. Right. But hopefully by that point, the antibody test will be out. That will also affect what we do. Um, you know, there's question of this resurging or, or reemerging in the fall, you know, um, uh, so that is another possibility, you know, but hopefully we'll have more weapons by that time. They are working on vaccines and human beings right now. Uh, they're kind of speeding everything up. Um, they're working on vaccines. Um, uh, usually a vaccine takes a year, year and a half to you know come to fruition. Um, but um, uh, they're trying to speed that up also. So it is possible not very likely, but possible by the fall, we could have something, um, probably not, but, but it is still a possibility in as far as vaccines, but, um, definitely the antibody tests are already out there. They're not readily available. Like I called lab core last week to see if they, if the lab, if the antibody tests were available and they're not, at least not at lab core. Um, uh, so I think that's the first step in us getting out of there is getting the um, antibody tests. Um, we're social beings. Nothing's going to change that. It's just going to be a different type of social. And and going back to some comments you were making earlier, um, you know, uh, around sleep, Mark was saying that uh, everyone's talking about the change in their sleep habits. Uh, and Julia um, uh, commented that she's been having very vivid dreams recently. Um, so it looks like this is, you know, somewhat uh, of a common experience for folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, we said everybody reacts to a stress differently. You know, I'm a doctor. You know, it's kind of in my DNA. I'm actually getting five or six hours of sleep. I, I'm more energized. It, you know, I, I feel like I want to go out and fight this thing. It's like intrinsic. Um, that's a fight for flight type response. You know, and people react differently. I found myself on Facebook numerous hours, you know, just trying to connect with people desperately, um, trying to give them, you know, advice and hope. And, you know, it's kind of been my um, modus operandi. Um, uh, you know, I feel like I'm doing something. You know, that's where I get my energy. Other people get stressed out. They can't sleep. You know, they have disrupted sleep. You know, people react differently. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us. Uh, any other uh, final thoughts or any, any other uh, advice? Uh, that you can offer, uh, and Paula is saying uh, offering her thanks, and and we should mention that uh, you and Paula graduated uh, high school together uh, yep. back in uh, 1982. So Paula, thank you for introducing us uh, to uh, Dr. Johari. We do have a, one more question from Philip before we close. Um, any thoughts on exercise and diet? Uh, are we supposed to be exercising and eating healthy, or staying uh, you know uh, sedentary and and eating all the junk food in sight? That's what I've been doing. I mean, I don't know about other people, but yeah, yeah, but but um, you really need to keep up your exercise routine. You, you know, I, I had gotten into CrossFit for about eight months, you know, prior to this, and and uh, shout out to CrossFit Perimeter, Dave Flynn and the crew. But um, uh, obviously we stopped that because you couldn't go in. But they're doing tele um uh exercise programs, you know, barbell club and 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 um weightlifting. Uh, Dave actually went out and hand delivered equipment you know, to different individuals, you know, that needed so they could partake in the exercise. Exercise decreases stress, right? Stress decreases your immunity, 
right? So obviously exercise is going to be important. You can still do it again, keeping the social distance um, uh, measures um, in check, you know, six feet apart, you know, that type of thing. Uh, we went for a walk with the kids and, and a guy went running by us and breathing heavily. He had a lot of heavy cologne, it, you know, and as he ran by, you could smell the cologne so strongly. It shows you how, you know, uh, you know, particles can carry in the air, you know, so you definitely want to keep your distance. Um, diet's important for the same thing, you know, um, keeping your immunity up to decrease your risk of catching the infection. Uh, but, but the last thing I'd want to say would, would be um, let's stay positive. We are going to come out of this. Um, uh, I, I have no doubt we're going to come out of this and hopefully we'll come out as a stronger nation. Thank great. you very much, Doc. And thank you, Neil. It's great to uh, have you. There's so many great comments coming in, people just thanking you, Doctor. We're so, so grateful. And Neil, great job as host as always. Uh, I was supposed to be traveling today, Doc, and here I am uh, at home. And this gives me a chance to work behind the scenes while Neil does a great job. Uh, Doc, or people can find you on Twitter, right? And uh, it's Albert Johari is the Twitter handle and albertjohari.md.com. What's on your website? What can people find? Um, uh, honestly, we, albertjohari.md.com would be my website. Um, uh, I honestly don't have a lot there now. You know, we, we use Facebook as our main medium um, for communicating. That's, that's great. And I'm sure you, you get lots of great traffic and traction from your Facebook as well. So we'll let you go. Uh, what do you have planned for today? Uh, just taking it easy. You know, um, we got a couple of uh, other teleconferences this afternoon with the kids. They're involved with St. Jude leadership, you know, so we're trying to get them involved with that and um, uh, just kind of taking it easy and join the family and um, uh, <laughs> yeah. And look, even the judge is saying outstanding information and message, doctor. So we have the judge Thank and you. the doctor talking to each other. I All love right. that. And uh, we, uh, we'd we like you to stay on for about an hour after this, Doc, and tell us all about Paula Kiger, our producer. <laughs> okay. What are the good stories? <laughs> we want that valedictorian, valedictorian of our class. She was? Valedictorian. She was valedictorian. I was the third. She was valedictorian. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Okay, but I want to hear the other, other the, the juicy stuff also. So please stick around for a couple of hours. Okay. It was at All Union right. County High School in Lake Butler, yeah. Florida in yeah. 1982. What was the music then? Do you remember what was like? Oh, absolutely. Year? Absolutely. What were, the movies? Uh, what, were you, what were you watching? Uh, it was ACDC, um, Back in Black, Saturday Night Fever. Well, actually, that was earlier. Um, uh, I can't, I can't. Uh, go for that, uh, Daryl Hall and John Oates. Yes, uh, I love it. Olivia Newton John. Yeah, and I, I just want to say that our hearts also go out to all the seniors in both high school and in college who are losing out on this. Uh, their, you know, the wonder wonders of being in high school in senior year. And we saw the style section as an entire story about all dressed up and nowhere to go on the prom. So. Uh, you know, we want to restore as much normalcy as we can, but we need to stay safe, stay socially distant. And because some of the horrible things we're seeing on TV, including chants of fire Dr. Fauci, or not, they don't even call him doctor, right? Just fire Fauci, fire Fauci, that the president then retweets, just absolutely unacceptable. Thank you very much, doctor, to you and to all our medical friends. We are really grateful. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, guys. Be safe. All right. Uh, Neil, great show. Let's make sure we thank our sponsors again, Strategy Focus Group, as well as Tweeps Map and Muckrack. And I wanted to show everybody the great stats that we're collecting through Tweeps Map. It's just one of the many things you get if you are a user of Tweeps Map. And look at this. Uh, this is a report of the last 30 days or so. And uh, we've had 435 tweets, 104 contributors from 10 countries, 35 cities. A million people are the, is the potential reach of the audience of our 104 contributors. This is not people watching alone. These are people who bothered to tweet with the hashtag NYT read along. So imagine our audience, of course, is you know uh, multiples of that, uh, maybe 10 times or more. And we're so glad that so many people are um, are tweeting and posting, and we're seeing influencers, influencers with the most followers, including Shelly Kramer and Grand Central Pub, and uh, Jennifer Mendelsohn. Treat. Yeah. And I think this is actually the report from la after last yeah, it week. Is. It so. is from last week, but you know, this gives them a sense of uh, roughly what the last 30 days or so yeah. is like. So Those numbers are going to be even, even stronger with uh, uh, Judge Rosemary 
yeah. uh, as a guest today and, and some of the great content. So we'll make sure to show that. And uh, one of the things that I always, I always want to show is the importance of not just having people with big accounts tweet you, which is great, or big accounts follow you, which is great. But look at the people who post the most. That matters, right? So you have Neil and Paula. Of course, they're part of the production team. But we have uh, Stefan and Laura, who is a viewer and a former guest. Steve was a producer. Carla Baranak is former copy chief of the New York Times, national copy chief, posting so often. And Tim McDonald, thank you. And Rose, who's a producer on our daily program. It's just so nice to see all of this uh, data available. We want to show this to our sponsors, including Map, and saying, like, this is the value of supporting us and supporting the New York Times read along. We are very grateful, as we are grateful to all the people who sponsor our other programming. And I want to uh, tell everybody that we have some great shows coming up that you will love uh, and learn a lot from, uh, including tonight, my 9 p.m. positivity every Sunday uh, around COVID-19. Uh, ben Tal uh, Sahar is, is Tal Ben Sahar is going to join us, who is who teaches happiness and taught that at Harvard and is just a rock star. You will enjoy listening to him tomorrow, 4:30 p.m. We're going to be talking all about learning how to use Twitter better. And then we have a doctor's Ask the Doctor show on Tuesday night at seven o'clock. We have the former ambassador of the United States to India, Richard Verma, who happens to be Indian American speaking with us about the world and what's going on. We have a wonderful conversation with the folks who are producing content for the International Red Cross and uh, how they're doing social media for that. And then we have a fabulous, uh, unusual conversation about love and relationships during COVID-19. Elizabeth Bernstein, who has just published today a, a piece about how uh, relationships and uh, and dating and all of that is working during the crisis. She'll be joining us along with uh, one of the leader of the Kinsey Institute. So it's going to be really fab fabulous. Mm -hmm. We're so much in, in store for all of you. Please do join us. Please connect with me at Sri on Twitter. Sri at Sri.net is my email. If you're not getting alerts, let me know. Please connect with us on YouTube. That's the best way to get alerts to this show the evening show, all the shows that we do, including my Hong Kong shows. We're gonna do a concert from Hong Kong this week. We've been interviewing, as some of you know, uh, great uh, experts from Hong Kong on the medical field. But today we're gonna, uh, this Thursday, we're gonna uh, listen to some music that's produced live. And that's one of the things that my team, our team does at DigiMentors. If you have a an event that you wanna take digital, please get in touch with us. We can produce a TV-like show that you're seeing now. We're working on so many different projects, including for an Ivy League school. We're doing a project tomorrow, Monday, about uh, a Holocaust Memorial Day celebration and remembrance. So all of that, please be in touch with me, Sri at Sri.net. We'd love to help you and your organization. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Neil, I don't know, uh, all the effort you put into the weekly production I am missing every one of those steps because we don't have enough production support. We have two great producers in Vandana and Rose who do great work, but it shows you why we need sponsors and why we need the, the financial support. So please get in touch. We have very easy and easy to understand uh, uh, as sponsorship possibilities. Thanks very much, everybody. Neil, any last words before you go? Uh, no, just uh, uh, reminding people they can email you at shri at shri.net. If they're interested in, in, in having us produce a show like this for you. Um, and uh, Paula, uh, thanking everyone for joining us. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone as well and do a uh, another a personal thank you to everyone for joining us and for all the support um, over these years with the New York Times Read Along and for when we uh, you know talk about personal issues. I know that when a few weeks ago when Shri talked about uh, losing a, a friend to coronavirus, um, that was also uh, very difficult. And I think that it just speaks to how great a community we've built up, that you've built up, uh, that we have a, a safe space here to be human and be emotional and um, find that support. So thank you to all of our viewers. Thank you to all the new people that joined us uh, this week. And hopefully you'll come back uh, next Sunday uh, for a great show. 8.30 to 10.30, right? Uh, 
37 minutes. That's okay. Uh, 8.30 uh, to 10.30. Yeah, we haven't, I didn't ask permission, but I'm going to see if our producers can come online and we can give another up. Uh, Steve has said yes. <laughs> uh, Julia is going to give me a yes. And there she is. And uh, here is Paula Kiger. Thank you all for being here. You guys are amazing. This is the team, folks, that you can uh, work with, that I work with to do all this amazing work. We're so grateful. It takes a village to produce shows like this. And we're so grateful to each of you. Uh, thank you so much for being here, for uh, bringing along this community. We all learn so much. And look at what Mark says. Mark says, you are all awesome. And uh, there, please follow them. Uh, Steve Derive on Twitter, Julia L. Weeks on Twitter, at Big Green Pen on Twitter. And, uh, and of course, Thanks. at Neil Parik. Neil Parik. And, yeah. and um, you know, what a great production team. Again, you know, to, to remind folks, the way that we work it, you know, we, we have people in uh, various Facebook uh, pages and on LinkedIn um, to answer your comment, to, to make sure that you can, we can engage with people. Um, and I want to thank both of you, thank all of you for the support you offer on a weekly basis. Um, it, you know, we started off with just Sri on, um, on uh, uh, Facebook Live and offering comments and, and context. Um, but now it's a full-fledged show. We brought in Julia as well um, for this week's show, uh, and I asked her to, to stay parked in my Facebook page since we're streaming there uh, this week. So thank you for what a great job that you do uh, week in, week out. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. And we're seeing some of the great comments from Rosemary. Love the show. Thank you for inviting me. Mark saying all you are awesome. Uh, Laura Silverman, uh, an all-star production team. Uh, uh, Marilyn Zayford, another friend of ours, saying great job. So these are just some of the kudos, well-deserved kudos that uh, you're getting. And and Daryl seconding that as well. I just want to say to everyone that uh, we can do this because of the energy you give us through your likes, your shares, your comments every week. And we want your suggestions for guest speakers. So please let us know if you have a guest speaker, please email us or a theme you want us to hit on. And if you have a doctor or nurse who could be on our show, uh, we'd like to do that as long as the crisis is going on. We would like to have this extra half hour and we can only do that because these producers have agreed to do that. So thank you all as well. We have a meeting right after this, a debrief, uh, uh, but uh, thank you all. And uh, let's say goodbye, Neil. I'm gonna uh, end the broadcast. Neil, you get the last word. Great, well, my last word is, uh, is again, a thank you to everyone on the screen and to our viewers. And of course, this week to uh, Rosemary, uh, Rosemary Aquilina and Albert Johari uh, for making uh, uh, this, um, this show very special. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.